five, four, three, two, one, ignition. Earlier this month, NASA tested a key safety system on its new Orion spacecraft in the sky above Florida. In a simulated emergency, the spacecraft aborted a takeoff and split off from the speeding rocket, propelling itself safely away. The test was a key milestone in NASA's ambitious plan to return astronauts to the moon. Mark Kirisic is the NASA program manager for Orion at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. You look at it from the outside and you say, boy, that's the same shape as Apollo. And it is, and the reason it is because we learned the Apollo guys had the shape right. But you look underneath the skin and just about every other aspect of Orion is different. Kirisic took me inside a full-scale model of the spacecraft that NASA uses to study how the crew interacts with the ship and its systems. Come on in and watch your step and welcome to the inside of an Orion spacecraft. So four people are going to ride in this? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and by, by capsule standards, our astronaut team will tell you this is a quite a roomy spacecraft. <laughs> this is roomy? This is roomy. <laughs> you also have to remember, in space, everything is a floor, everything is a ceiling, so you can sleep on the walls, you can walk on the ceiling. <laughs> the Orion is built by aerospace company Lockheed Martin, and it's designed to support a crew for weeks at a time. Snake your way in like this. Okay. And unlike the spacecrafts used in the Apollo missions, it's <laughs> flexible for astronauts of all sizes. Oh, wow. These seats, this cockpit's designed for what we call a 5% female, a very small woman, to a 95th percentile male, a very large man. The Orion capsule is a key part of NASA's Artemis program, named after the twin sister of the Greek god Apollo. Artemis will be a sequence of missions starting with a flight with no crew in 2020, a flight with the crew in 2022 that will orbit the moon, and then a 2024 mission that will land humans on the moon's south pole. Unlike the Apollo program, Artemis aims to establish a sustained presence on the moon and set the stage for further exploration to Mars. Small scale tests Jeff done. Radigan is Using the lead flight director for Artemis 2, the first flight with astronauts, astronauts in 2022. So it's really a stepping stone, one mission after the other, building on capability. Okay, so some people are going to watch this and say, look, we did that 50 years ago. Why do it again? Why go back? You know, we haven't been back to the moon in 50 years, and it's, it's out there waiting for us. It's out there with so much we've discovered over the last 50 years with the unmanned spacecraft that have gone on there. really gives us the opportunity to go back and, and then stay there. Radigan points to the 2009 discovery of water on the moon as a key resource to support long-term habitation and future exploration. It could be harvested to drink, turned into oxygen for breathing, and the hydrogen it contains could be used as rocket fuel. The end of the Apollo lunar missions in 1972 did not mark the end of astronauts in space for NASA. The space shuttle program flew 135 missions between 1981 and 2011. Its successes included launching scientific instruments like the Hubble telescope and helping build the International Space Station, or ISS. But the program also suffered two catastrophes that killed 14 astronauts, the Challenger, which blew up just after liftoff in 1986, and the Columbia, which disintegrated re-entering the Earth's atmosphere in 2003. Since the shuttle program ended, NASA has relied on the Russian Soyuz rocket to transport astronauts to the ISS and private companies like SpaceX to carry supplies and hardware. Meanwhile, the space station has been continuously occupied by an international group of astronauts since November of 2000. We've learned how to live and work in space for very long periods of durations. We've, we've learned how to keep people healthy, how to exercise, the kinds of foods to take, so people can survive on very long missions in space. So we take those lessons and we say, this is what it's going to take if you want to live on the moon and work on the moon? Yes, correct. Well, we're in low Earth orbit. We're still only a couple hours away. We're just a couple hundred miles away from Earth. Yeah. Now, these missions we're about to embark on are hundreds of thousands of miles away, five-day trips. There is no two-hour emergency ride home to Earth. So we have to learn how to become less reliant on the Earth. Whether or not America should embark on a new moon mission has been subject to changing political forces. In 2004, President George W. Bush directed NASA to return to the moon. But in 2010, the Obama administration scrapped the mission for being over budget and behind schedule, focusing instead on a future mission to Mars. 
In 2017, the Trump administration pivoted back to the moon, targeting 2028 for the mission. Then earlier this year, the administration sped up the timetable. It is the stated policy of this administration and the United States of America to return American astronauts to the moon within the next five years. What happens when you scoot the deadline up? That's a lot of pressure on the engineers and everyone else that was planning on something way down the line, right? You know, it, it changes your schedule, obviously. Uh, there's always going to be uh, pressure to get your job done as well as you can, but that's balanced by having the resources to do it, right? And so I think we've done a pretty good job at NASA of trying to explain that equation to the administration and to say, absolutely, we can support 2024. We'd love to support 2024. We're all on board with that. Now here's how we would do it, and here's the resources it would take to get there. Yeah. So you have the resources that you need now? So I appreciate the administrator you know, working with Congress and the, and, uh, the administration to get the resources, right? Yeah. And uh, I applaud the administrator for saying that's going to take more money, and I know that folks are working very hard to, uh, to make that happen. Six. Five. Four. NASA believes it will take an additional four to six billion dollars a year over the next five years, on top of its roughly 21 billion dollar annual budget to meet the 2024 lunar deadline. Taking that potential increase into account, the agency's budget is around half of one percent of all federal spending. While that may sound like a lot, NASA is actually trying to do more with less. At the height of the Apollo program in the mid-1960s, federal spending on NASA accounted for nearly 4% of the total U.S. budget. Adding to financial pressure, NASA has been plagued with cost overruns on several key components, including the Space Launch System, or SLS, the large rocket that will send the Orion spacecraft into lunar space. A 2018 Inspector General report found that Boeing, which is making the SLS rocket, will likely spend nearly double the budgeted amount while delivering the rocket more than two and a half years late. Mark Kirisic says NASA needs to find a way to entice private industry to invest in space exploration. So right now we're working on uh, commercializing the International Space Station, tourist sorts of things, scientific endeavors, and the moon offers some special opportunities, mining on the moon. So there can be businesses that take advantage, and that's, and that's what we're trying to do, find businesses, motivate businesses that can then make a profit by flying space missions. Uh, mining operations on the moon, I mean, it seems so sci-fi, but who gets to mine the moon? I mean, are we doing this as humanity, as one species, so to speak, together? Are we doing it as countries? Are we doing this as companies? Well, so we'll have to develop the laws, the international laws, and we'll have to work those sorts of things out. Those are legal questions. I'm still working on the engineering <laughs> problems. Yeah. Okay. Kirisic may be focusing on engineering problems, but the fact is space exploration is no longer just a two-country race between the United States and the Soviet Union, as it was known in the 60s. Space agencies in Europe, Japan, and India have also sent probes to the moon. Most recently, China landed a rover on the far side of the moon in January. Fifty years ago, in the sprint to get to the moon, it was really just two runners. Now, in this marathon that is space exploration, you've got a lot more runners coming in. What does that do to the, to the, to the race? You know, not everybody's going the same place is the first thing I'll tell you, right? It, it really opens up the options for uh, more runners to run different races, uh, to use your, yeah. your analogy. I have no doubt that there'll be some competition involved, yeah. and uh, competition can be a healthy thing. The more space vehicles, the more countries that want to go to the moon and out into the solar system, the better. We just need to ensure that you know we're at least not working against each other, even if we're not working together. Are you optimistic about that? I am. I think we've got. I think the hazards are so great, and the cost of failure is so high that folks are incentivized to work together. In our lifetime, despite the promise of more cooperation in space exploration. Countries, including the United States, still want to be first. And sending astronauts to Mars is clearly the next big milestone. It's a goal that President Trump made explicit earlier this month. Someday soon, we will plant the American flag on Mars. It's happening to you. you want everybody looking at the views of the spacecraft. NASA Flight Director Jeff Radigan says the agency is well positioned to eventually send astronauts to the Red Planet. Where I see us in 20 years is taking that first trip to Mars. Where I see us in 40 years is doing the same thing around Mars that we're doing around the moon today, hmm. which is having that permanent presence, having those folks there for a year or more, and uh, just continuing out into the solar system.